Welcome, everyone. I'm Michelle Hicks, the Senior Manager in Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion, and I'm honored to be your host today. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to remind all of us that respect is fundamental to our commitment to diversity, equality, and inclusion, and we expect it from ourselves and from each other at all times. Integrity matters. Micron's Code of Business Conduct and Ethics applies to all of us, whether we're on site and sitting in a conference room or if we're working remotely and on a Zoom meeting. Respect is foundational for an inclusive culture. And before we get started, I'll let you know that we will have time for questions at the end of the panel. If you'd like to ask a question, you may submit questions through the Q&A icon to be read out loud, or you may use the raise my hand feature, and I'll call on you to ask your question directly. And with that, with that let's go ahead and begin. The depiction of Asian Americans in both news and entertainment media historically reinforces unflattering stereotypes. Classic movie fans might think of a non-Asian Mickey Rooney depicting Mr. Yuniyoshi in Breakfast at Tiffany's. If you're a Gen Xer like me, you may recall the character Long Duck Dong from the movie Sixteen Candles, or more recently, think of Ken Jeong's character in The Hangover. Generally, Asian American men are emasculated while women are exoticized, but the lasting impression makes Asians out to be perpetual foreigners with devastating consequences. We heard about some of the historical mistreatment of Asian American and Pacific Islander community during our panel earlier this week, along with some of the amazing accomplishments of this community. And if you missed it, the replay is now posted on Micron Now, so I encourage you to go watch it. But my family experienced the consequences of these stereotypes directly during World War II. My grandparents, who were second-generation Japanese-Americans, or Nisei, lived in Seattle when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor during World War II. And like many other West Coast Japanese, they were removed from their homes and sent to live behind barbed wire in the Tule Lake prison camp, even though they were born in the United States and were U.S. citizens. The fear of the foreigner still translates today in the violence many of the AAPI community have experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Stop AAPI Hate reports nearly 3,800 incidents of violence over the course of this past year. Yet according to a recent survey, 37% of Caucasian Americans said they were not aware of an increase in hate crimes and racism against Asian Americans over the past year, even after the Atlanta shooting experienced in March. So let's talk about what that all means with our panelists today. First, I'm excited to introduce to you Harmeet Kaur. She is a culture writer for CNN, where she covers race, identity, and social justice. She's dedicated to telling long neglected stories about minority communities with sensitivity and nuance. In 2019, she reported a story from the ground in Houston about the Sikh community using her language skills and cultural knowledge to capture details no other outlet had. Recently, she covered the mourning of the Sikh community following a deadly mass shooting at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis, overwhelmingly staffed by Sikhs. Jonah Shaw is an actress who most recently voiced a character in Raya and the Last Dragon, alongside Daniel Day Kim, Sandra Oh, Aquafina, and Kelly Marie Tran, and more. The movie is Disney's first to feature a Southeast Asian princess. She has worked on 30 TV shows and films, including The Flash, Spider-Man Homecoming, Gifted, and Keeping Up with the Joneses. She's also breaking barriers as a quarterback who was on Team USA women's preliminary roster. Benny Luo is the founder and CEO of NextShark, a media destination for Asian American news from politics to entertainment. NextShark's content reaches up to 15 million people per week on social media. NextShark has been cited by the New York Times, Forbes, BBC, CNN, Fox, and more, and has led coverage of anti-Asian violence since early 2020. In the past year, site traffic has increased fivefold in line with the rising attacks. And finally, we're joined by Bing Chen. He is an impact entrepreneur leveraging storytelling to deliver greater socioeconomic equity. He is the president and co-founder of Gold House, a collective of Asian American founders, creative voices, and leaders dedicated to fighting for more authentic representation. Last year, he founded Ohm Group, a fund investing in multicultural films and storytellers. 
Previously, he was YouTube's global head of creator development and management, where he was an original architect of the multi-billion dollar influencer ecosystem when YouTube's content creator strategy was just in its infancy. So let's get started now with our panelists. We want to start with a round robin question. Growing up, how much representation of Asian Americans did you see on screen and how did that affect you in both your lives then and now? Uh, let's go ahead and get started with Bing. Uh, I have an unpopular answer for this. Uh, by the way, first and foremost, thank you so much, Michelle and Steffi, especially for having all of us. We know uh, the, the API group is new over at Micron, so thank you for the space and the commitment, especially at this level of corporation. Uh, it does speak volumes, especially because of the growing customer base looks like people like us. Uh, my four heroes since I was three, uh, to be annoying and pedantic, were Gandhi, Mother Teresa, MLK Jr., and Walt Disney. Uh, two of those people are, of course, South Asian, um, so I never felt like I was not seen. I felt like I was seen at the highest highest existential level since I was a boy. Uh, and then finally, I always thought that Walt Disney was actually Mickey Mouse because I was three and an idiot. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I, Mickey Mouse to me, at least visibly, was also Asian because he had black hair and his complexion resembled mine. Um, so three of my four heroes ostensibly were API. Uh, and, and I found sort of a, a great source of inspiration, I think, from that. Excellent. Thank you so much. And let's go to Harmeet. Yeah, um, so my answer is a little different from Bing's. Um, I think growing up, um, especially in a predominantly white region, um, I think I just internalized that I wasn't going to see people who look like me or my family. Um, it, I think I just felt like we were too different. There weren't that many of us, and the few that there were weren't going to be working in Hollywood. Um, so even just like seeing a turban sick man as an extra or like making a brief appearance in a commercial would be something my family would get excited about. Um, I think, you know, just off the top of my head, what I can remember, um, I think we had Slumdog Millionaire, um, that NBC show outsourced, um, and of course, Apu from The Simpsons. But, you know, I think it wasn't until we um, so like got older and we got stuff like Master of None, um, Never Have I Ever, that... I really felt like I started feeling myself depicted on screen. Um, so I look back on it now and I just think, um, you know, that was so sad that I felt that at the time because it diminished my sort of sense of self-worth and that our communities really matter. Um, and now, you know, I, I feel our, our communities definitely matter. Our stories deserve to take up just as much space as anyone else's. Exactly. Benny, what, can we hear from you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction. And uh, thank you so much for you know giving me the space uh, to speak today. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in the Bay Area, born and raised there to Chinese immigrant parents that came here in the 80s. Uh, my parents were really, really conservative, uh, you know, Chinese parents, truly traditional. But, uh, you know, they, they had a they had a very like, you know, strong immigrant story. Like my mom uh, swam from mainland China to Hong Kong, uh, you know, to escape the aftermath of the, uh, the, the of, of the uh, cultural revolution. And uh, she actually got caught twice and she had to go to jail. Uh, and then on the third try, she finally made it. And so, you know, when I when I grew up, um, you know, I actually consumed a lot of like, uh, I guess, uh, Hong Kong and Chinese content movies and everything. And so, you know, I, I was uh, kind of faced, you know, some, with some of the stars that we might notice today, like Jet Li, like Jack, Jackie Chan growing up. But when it came to like consuming media in the mainstream, I mean, we didn't really see those. Uh, I, I didn't really see too many people like me. And, you know, as I got older and as you saw more, like, I guess, like of these uh, martial arts stars from China over here, I mean, you know, I saw like, let's say Jet Li and like Lethal Weapon. I saw, you know, uh, Jet Li and Romeo Must Die. But for some reason, there was always like, they were always presented in a certain way. And it really wasn't, um, it was just very different from the way they, you know, kind of looked when they were, you know, doing movies in, in the motherland. And, you know, it, when I was young, I didn't really you know, think about it too much, but there was a weird feeling about it. And it was it really wasn't until I got older and I started learning about like Asian American representation in the media and how we've been presented and, and, you know, taking, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to have like Asian American courses, uh, you know, at UC Irvine when I went there. And so I was able to kind of learn a lot of these things of like, you know, how the emasculation of, you know, Asian men on screen to, you know, the, the objectification, the exotic, exotization of, you know, Asian women. And so it, it was one of those things where living in it was, you know, you've noticed that something was kind of off, but it took me a little bit of time to really kind of, you know, see it from a bird's eye view and kind of see what was really going on. So that was kind of my experience. Very good. Thank you for sharing. And Jonah, um, can you share a little bit about your experience? Sure. For me, I would say I saw very little Asian representation growing up. So, um, you know, 
in just growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, um, I felt very other um, at all times and just desperately trying to fit in um, at every given moment. And a lot of that feeling of other had to do with me being one of the few Asians. And so I think a lot of the stereotypes and the teasing and the bullying that I experienced growing up, I attribute at least part of that to entertainment and and what uh, the lack of representation that we had in the media, because I think racism is learned and entertainment has a huge impact on how people think and feel. Um, And then as an actress, I remember I would have all these fights with my father because he didn't want me to be an actress. And he was like, look, Jonah, like maybe, maybe I could support you if there were other Asian actresses on TV and film. And I remember in tears uh, yelling at him, I'm like, well, there's Lucy Liu. And then I just couldn't name others. Um, But there was Lucy. (laughs) And so that's what I shared with my father. Um, And I'm glad that... uh, it has been changing and evolving um, because I think we really needed that. Well, yeah. And uh, it's great to see you out there and having so much success. Thank um, you. Is this, a, is this a conversation that you find yourself having um, with some of the uh, creatives that you're working with as you're engaging in projects? Do, do you talk about the impact of stereotypes of Asian Americans and, and how you know, the roles that you are participating in might help to overcome those? Sure. So I um, haven't recently had, I I guess, a a direct dialogue. Um, However, I think as an artist, um, I do feel a responsibility to be careful of um, furthering harmful stereotypes um, in roles that I play. So for instance, I am on season two of a crime drama on AMC called Hightown. And um, the showrunner actually called me and she wanted uh, it to be a little bit more accurate. So she asked, you know, what specific ethnicity um, I am. And we had a dialogue, which was really nice. Um, And I play a stripper on the show. And so that could potentially easily go into the category of just Um, exoticized, eroticized Asian female, right? So for me, what was uh, really important was creating a very three-dimensional character that on the surface, um, she seemed like just a bubbly, uh, ditzy, sexualized Asian woman, but you saw like um, her fight, um, how much she cared about her daughter, like the circumstances she was under and how smart and resourceful um, and human she really was. And so that was very important to me in the portrayal of this character that could have easily been a stereotype. So I think um, we do have an opportunity as artists to have those dialogues with the writers, creatives, showrunners. Um, And I, in my experience, I have found that um, they tend to be pretty open to those conversations. That's, that's excellent. Now, one area where um, I know, Harmi, you are having some impact is the way that you are able to approach and cover some of the different kinds of uh, stories and storytelling that, that, that you're having um, at CNN. I'm wondering, um, how do you balance objective reporting in the case of tragedies such as the Indianapolis shooting or the Atlanta shooting, where you may see a situation where officials are are slow to deem them hate crimes? Um, I even recall from the Atlanta shooting, one of the sheriff's books, people saying the shooter had a bad day almost brushing off the the violence that had just been perpetrated against the Asian community. How do you maintain objectivity while knowing that some of the readers might take statements like that from authority figures at face value, look at them as an authority and and also um, not recognize the that this violence may also have ties to um, racial uh, stereotypes? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... You know, when I report, I try actually not to come from a place of feeling like I have to remove myself from the story. Um, In fact, I actually think that my experiences um, can help make the story even stronger, right? I mean, if you um, are covering the Atlanta spot shootings and you don't point out that the majority of those killed were Korean women, um, you're not doing your job as a journalist, right? That context is so key. and we, we know that throughout history, AAPI folks have been scapegoated during times of political tension or crises. Um, so we know that this is, you know, not a 
new thing. You know, we know that white supremacy is a major, nas- major national security threat when you're not um, including the context of all those things. You um, are not fully reporting the story. Um, that said, uh, accuracy is really tantamount to what we do and we have to be really precise in our language. So hate crime is an official legal designation. Um, and so we can't call something a hate crime if it has not been officially declared one. But at the same time, we can include context about um, how this is being perceived in the community. We can talk about the background of the perpetrator of the attack that we might um, just, if they have, um, if there may be bias involved, if they you know have a history of browsing certain websites, um, we can include that, we can include the history piece. And I think all of that can help readers take away a fuller picture. Well, and following Atlanta, there were critical facts that were really only reported by Korean language media, such as the shooter reportedly yelling, I'm here to kill all Asians. And similarly, for the Indianapolis shooting, the Sikh coalition gathered survivor accounts. They pointed to incidents being racially motivated. Well, you know, there were few outlets that were reporting that the shooter was known to browse white supremacist websites. And some of these facts just didn't make it into the mainstream media. So, Benny, I'm curious for your take on why these stories are overlooked by mainstream media. And I'm wondering, is that part of Next Shark's mission to kind of bridge these gaps or fill in those gaps? Yeah, I mean, I think the only simple answer I could give in terms of why mainstream media doesn't cover it is uh, who are the racists of the people in power? Um, you know, what ethnicity are they? Because like, you know, if, if you don't really have like any Asian Americans or, you know, Pacific Islanders, like in those positions of power that can really like add context to note, like, you know, some of these stories that are extremely important. Um, you know, I don't think they're ever really gonna, gonna make it, you know, one of the things that's unique about Next Shark is that, you know, we're for fully minority owned, uh, you know, m- large majority of our staff, like well over like 80, 90% of it, you know, are self-identifying, you know, Asians and Asian Americans. And I think that, you know, having and understanding those little nuances, like kind of puts us um, on a different sort of, I guess, uh, on a different playing field in a sense. And I think that, um, you know, for us, we, we see a lot of, uh, you know, s- uh, so many different nuances to how mainstream covers things. And, you know, uh, yeah, especially when instances of like Asian issues, I mean, some of the things like, let's say, during the height of the uh, COVID pandemic 2020, um, you know, last just last year, if you looked at mainstream media, a lot of the times, if they if like a story didn't have anything to do with the Asian community or Asians in general, but it was COVID-19 related. You all you always saw like, you know, feature images with like Asian people with the mask on and everything. And, you know, and a lot of people don't really understand those slight uh, nuances that could have like, you know, lasting impact. Right. And I think that for us, um, I never really set out to, you know, you know, come in and be like, you know, oh, I want to offer this like for the community. I mean, you know, my, the, you know, the, the genesis of Next Shark that you see today was, was quite organic. And now don't get me wrong, like Asian American identity is something that really hits close to my heart. I mean, most of the fights and the bullying incidents that I went through growing up from from as young as kindergarten all the way up to high school was racially motivated, you know? And so that's something that's always hit close to my heart, but I just never really thought that, and, you know, I'm, gra- I'm grateful to be, to, to be able to, you know, build something that, you know, that, that can, you know, speak out for uh, this sort of, you know, for our community. Um, and in terms of covering hate crimes um, and the rise in anti-Asian rhetoric, I mean, it was, it kind of stemmed from, you know, we, we were covering hate crimes, like, you know, prior to the pandemic. I mean, you know, actually, as early as 2017, when we started, you know, covering more like, you know, Asian issues, when we started featuring more, uh, you know, successful um, Asian Americans, uh, people started reaching out to us going, hey, um, you know, you know, the crimes against Asian Americans are some of the, you know, uh, least reported. Um, you know, you guys should look into that. And so we, we, we've already, um, you know, we're looking into it. And at the time we were only getting about one to two news, news tips a week prior to the pandemic. Um, and most of these incidences we couldn't really follow up on due to, I don't know, like variety of reasons, not enough information or the victim not wanting to come forward or the family's not wanting to come forward. And it went up to up to 50 a day, almost like during like, you know, I, I think at the end of February, 2020. Right. And so I think that, um, you know, for us, one of the biggest challenges 
challenges that we have at Next Shark is that obviously there is the objective and that they're journalists that, you know, the mind of, of the journalists, right, for our reporters. But obviously, like, you know, when you're covering like this is like every day for the last year like every day covering, you know, some sort of attack over and over again, where, and you're subject to viewing like so much horrific footage, you know, and, you know, think about the mental toll that it takes on the team. And so I think for us, like me as the founder and the CEO, like one of the things that I've been doing a lot is, you know, keeping, you know, keeping tabs on my workers, making sure they're mentally okay, because, you know, it's tough with the job that you do, especially when it comes to instances that hit close to your heart. Yeah, no, I totally understand. And, um, and it's such a great point, too, about the images um, that are pandemic related, where they're showing images of Asian individuals. That's a microaggression. And we've had lots of conversations at Micron about that and have had some training. But I think that that um, is a result of some of the unconscious bias that folks who aren't um, really being intentional about what it is that they are showing might might bring in. And I think it's great having sources, uh, you know, like Next Shark that are um, helping to raise these stories um, to the attention of, of some of the more mainstream media in doing that. And being, I think that um, to a certain extent, that some of what you're group is doing uh, with the creative culture. You're, you're having um, opportunity to put people from the AAPI community in um, positions of, of storytelling, of um, overseeing um, content. Can you share a little bit about uh, why it's important to have um, multicultural films and storytellers um, behind, behind these projects? Yeah, happy to. Uh, I think first, in terms of the data, the majority of folks across multicultural communities and non-multicultural communities consume their information through film and television. So these are the two mediums that control you know, knowledge, as it were, and truth. The second important insight is that 80% of traditional media exported worldwide comes from the United States. These are, of course, film and TV shows. So what we engineer here is necessarily not just what 320 million people believe, but what 8 billion people at least consider, if not internalize, if not evangelize over time. And so we've built up at Gold House a really nice funnel across sort of the film ecosystem. The reason for film, no offense to my news counterparts uh, who are doing critical work, uh, but film is still considered the high art. Uh, when film sneezes, the rest of the rest of the media industry moves. And this is because of one, it's scarcity. So it's seen therefore as more premium, which is a silly human thing, but it is what it is. Uh, second is it also is the only ecosystem with an end to end um, uh, sort of support effort. So you have rigid development systems, rigid develop, rigid financing vehicles, uh, multiple distribution paths, both on and offline and multiple award ceremonies that sort of encapsulate it, plus major publishing houses devoted specifically to it. Uh, it is the only creative format that has that volume. And so uh, the good news is our community is doing phenomenal, phenomenal work in progress, I think. Uh, one is we actively consult uh, culturally on most of the major studio scripts to ensure that they're authentically accurate, to ensure that pernicious narratives like yellow peril, perpetual foreignerism, model minority myth, and physical meekness do not persist on the page. Uh, this is extremely important because getting accuracy and getting affirmation for our community right has to start at that level. If we wait till it's on TV or on the screen, we are categorically too late. The second piece is financing. So really excitingly, uh, Gold House has helped finance or facilitate the financing of seven different API-led studios. So there's an idea here where we can try to change incumbent systems, and we do, and luckily all of Hollywood is now listening and they're all being wonderful, but we also can't just wait for the system to change. We have to build our own houses as it were. And so whether it's through Randall Park's you know, uh, imminent collision, whether it's through Daniel Day Kim's 3AD, whether it's through my own film fund, we are telling our own stories by financing and greenlighting our own stories, and that parallel path is a, is a critical power. Uh, the third, of course, is distribution. Um, candidly, before three years ago, Hollywood did not believe there was a viable market for any API-led film. And I don't mean AAPI, I mean API. Um, this, of course, changed with Crazy Rich Asians because we are smart. And we know that when you develop an economy, you have to start with demand and supply catalytically follows. And so uh, just a quick anecdote, Crazy Rich Asians was only supposed to do 12 to $15 million at the opening weekend box office. That would have been a categorical fail. If it had not cleared $20 million, then there are five other API-led major $200 million films on the studio docket that would have been backburned. Now, here's the repercussion of that. If it didn't hit 20 
and those were backburned. That means that our community necessarily in the broader media space would have been put back in the film side at least by three to five years. That's not acceptable. Now, fast forward, of course, through history, we did 36 and a half million and crushed it, top 10, you know, or, uh, what is the highest grossing rom-com in the last decade. And the community as a whole has repeated that success for other great films, including Parasite and The Farewell, which were two of the best performing films opening weekend pre-pandemic um, by uh, per theater average, uh, which is the North Star metric in Hollywood. So distribution, we're doing quite well there too. The challenges now that we're facing are twofold. One is within award omission, and secondly is with cross-cultural activation. So within awards, we're still relegated to different foreign picture categories. We saw this famously at the Golden Globes. This may seem soft to intelligent people because they're frivolous awards, but let's be clear, your reduction to a non-major category is implicit xenophobia. There is no question about it. Um, and so many of us are fighting back on that and you'll see a material effort in the next two months there. The other piece though, is we also have to be aware of intersectionality, which everyone on this panel represents really nicely. Uh, if we only build for the API community, we will build ourselves into an island. And, and that's just not how humanity has evolved from Pangea. Uh, we have to do these things together particularly because we know that the challenges for a lot of multicultural folks are highly concentric, whether it's in civil rights acts of 1960s, or it's right now in trying to fight for both in front and behind the camera representation. Uh, and so really locking arms with our other multicultural counterparts, including and especially women who have actually ha been the hardest hit across every, uh, every category, both executives as well as creatively uh, is important. Um, so there's a lot of focus there across the, the cultural organizations too. And Jonah, um, in entertainment, you have recently voiced a character in Rhea and the Last Dragon, um, and there were many AAPI stars um, involved in that project. But in the past, it's been commonplace for white characters to voice or act minority characters. Um, think of Emma Stone and Aloha or Hank Azaria, who voiced Apu on The Simpsons and you know, has been apologizing for some of the stereotyping of Indian uh, people that he, that he did in, in creating that character. Um, but in cartoons, or excuse me, um, yeah, animation, <laughs> uh, folks might think, why is it a big deal if there's somebody who is non-Asian, who is voicing an Asian character? And I know you have some thoughts about this, about why maybe it is important to have that authentic representation, even if um, the characters are not live action. Sure, sure, absolutely. I think um, more and more, um, the voiceover actors uh, are getting a lot of attention and people know who's actually behind the voice. Um, I think back in the day that wasn't as commonplace, but I, I'm seeing that more, uh, more and more now. And I, I really think it's important for people to see themselves reflected in the media that they're consuming. And um, I, an example of this uh, it was a interesting situation I was in where I uh, voiced a role in um, a Netflix movie called Flavors of Youth. And um, when I did my recording, because uh, voiceover often the actors recording by themselves, um, I didn't know who would play my sister, the other lead in the project. And at the time, you know, I asked um, and I think the director said, oh, you know, we haven't, you know, we, we have, we tried to get Constance Wu. Um, we're still looking at some other um, Asian actors. And I said, okay, cool. I was just curious. And then I, I watched um, the animated project, uh, Flavors of Youth on Netflix. And um, the other actress voicing the role, my sister, did a great job. And then I was shocked when looking at the credits that it was voiced by Evan Rachel Wood from Caucasian Actress from Westworld and a lot of other projects. And uh, I, it was she did an amazing job. Um, and at the same time, I thought to myself, I'm pretty sure they could have found an, another fantastic Asian actress to play my sister in this um, project where it was set in China and these are Chinese characters. And so I think when someone sees that and even just watches the credits or looks up who played this role, I think it sends an unconscious message to um, that viewer that says that we are not good enough. Us as Asians are not good enough to voice, to play our own characters in film and TV. So I think that is very harmful. Yeah. Another issue that I think um, is is uh, happening frequently is that we are seeing that some of the racial jokes against Asian Americans in mainstream media um, are sometimes 
just brushed away as non-consequential. Um, thinking of things like Chris Rock um, showing Asian American children on stage in suits, I think during the Oscars and calling them the Price Waterhouse Cooper accountants and kind of playing into that model minority stereotype. Um, when things are normalized in this way, um, it can definitely have some harmful effects. And Benny, I know your organization covers not only politics, but also entertainment. Um, are you seeing that this is getting called out more? Are you noticing that that folks are not, um, not being as tolerant of these kinds of uh, stereotypes, even when they're, you know, allegedly being done in jest? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't ever want to claim that Next Shark's the voice of like all Asian Americans because like, <laughs> I don't think we are, you know, we're, we're made up of a very diverse, you know, set of people. Right. And um, I think that for us, we always see ourselves as like observers in the space. And just like every individual Asian American is trying to figure out like, what is their place here? What does it mean to be Asian American? Us, our entire staff, like we're going through that journey, just like you guys. Right. And I think that, um, and, and I think that that's, that, that's interesting in, in, in that way. Um, and I think that um, to answer your question, I, I believe so. I think, yes, that people are, are becoming, you know, less and less tolerant of these things. I'm especially really, um, you know, hopeful for the new generation because um, a majority of Next Shark's audience is, you know, within the 18 to 34 range. Like we have middle schoolers that, you know, that, you know, follow us. In fact, you know, what was so profound for me was like a few weeks ago, I, I did a talk um, at a university and one of the students who just entered, you know, as a freshman, you know, she's been following Next Shark ever since she was in high school. And then she was like, oh, now that, you know, I'm in college, I recruited some, like she recruited some of her classmates and they're trying to start the first Asian American studies program, right? And that's incredible, you know? And I think that, you know, whereas before I feel like definitely the new generation, they are not tolerant of these, you know, certain things and these small microaggressions and they are loud. They know exactly how to, you know, utilize social media to, to get the word out. I mean, Next Shark, we get like, you know, we get hundreds upon hundreds of, you know, messages across across our emails and DMs every day. And we can never keep up with, with everything. And they're just so on it. And, um, and so um, I think that the tides are definitely starting to shift. I think that, um, you know, uh, we, we, we see so many, um, I, I think that more and more people are starting to become more aware. I think that more actions are, are starting to be taken. I mean, for example, I mean, there was a, you know, there was a comedian, I think Tony Hitchcliffe or something that, you know, was using, you know, racial slurs, you know, after being introduced by, by a, by, by an Asian fellow comedian. Right. And, um, you know, I immediately, even before the video went viral, we were already getting like messages about it across all our, across everything. And then, you know, after um, obviously that news went viral, I mean, like he was dropped relatively quickly, you know, I think within days of, you know, these things happening. So it goes to show that, you know, I think that people are starting to become not tolerant of these, they want change. And I think that overall, we're heading in the right direction. That's excellent. And Harmeet, I'm curious to know, you know, you're at this big international um, news organization, CNN. Are you, are you seeing that kind of, um, those kinds of comments and um, that kind of interest, especially from young people, just in terms of the way stories are covered or um, what what the expectation is today. I mean, from our audiences and, yes, and what they want to see. Yes, from audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, whenever uh, we do a story that I feel like is nuanced, um, is sort of different than what you might expect um, mainstream media to do. I, I do see a lot of comments from readers saying, um, oh, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you for elevating these um, threads and these um, narratives to the national conversation. Um, I think there's definitely an audience for that, right? Um, I think before, you know, maybe a few years ago, we might've seen, um, editors and managers trying to make a case that um, these stories were niche, um, that maybe they didn't matter, um, that maybe CNN didn't really need to cover it because it's very special interest. But um, I think what I've seen from my reporting is that that's absolutely not the case. Um, there definitely is a market for this. Um, people are interested and that's also just how you grow your audience and build trust. Um, and, you know, I think doing these stories for us helps bring in readers that maybe weren't coming to us before, but now might start to see us as a place where they can get um, accurate, reliable, um, nuanced reporting. 
Another thing that I think you may have to balance as well is when there are situations where the perpetrator of a, a violent attack, like in the Virginia Tech shooting back in 2007, was somebody from the Asian community. Um, that can sometimes have a backlash against those communities. I'm just curious to know uh, what what is what are your thoughts about responsibly covering crimes of minorities, especially when it comes to race. Do is it is it always necessary to mention the race of the of the um, person who who committed a crime? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and it's really complicated. I think um, I. I really just think this is an area where we need to tread very carefully and ask ourselves questions um, like, is this person's racial or ethnic identity at all relevant to the crime? Um, Maybe we should wait to disclose that information before, um, until we know more um, about whether that might have influenced it. Um, And I think part of uh, the challenge here is that for so long, it's felt very uneven, right? Um, I think for a long time, I think this is starting to change now, but for a long time, um, if a perpetrator of an attack was white, you wouldn't see a headline that said, you know, white shooter gunned down um, dozens of people in a church or something like that. Um, But if it was the inverse, if it was um, someone, if it was a person of color, you might see a headline like that. Um, And I think that's where the sort of um, unevenness lies um, is that it, it feels unbalanced and unfair because it feels like the race is only relevant if the person is a minority. So again, I think it's just about being careful, um, being taking our time, um, asking the questions about um, what is relevant and being responsible and just thinking about um, what harmful tropes or narratives we might be promoting with those kinds of headlines. Sure. Well, I think that we've, uh, you know, covered a lot of different issues just in terms of um, from from the the media coverage to to some of the different um, experiences and entertainment that folks have had. But I'm wondering, how have you or are you all um Seen, seen other kinds of changes in your own work with some of these long-standing narratives. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Bing, maybe we can start with you just in terms of some of the mainstream narratives and 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 how how you're seeing some of those change. It's so tough because I, I think I, I'll bring up the three problems or the three challenges we face. One is it, it indeed takes all kinds, not just within a single industry of different profiles of folks to address authenticity and so forth along the chain, but also different media formats. So I'll stay in my lane where where we play, which is like film and television. As Jonah just mentioned, like even if we write something specifically, that's not to say the producer is going to cast specifically. It is not to say it is shot specifically. And so we constantly have to monitor this. The other thing that we constantly think about is news is essential places. It precipitates and defines narrative as it's just like the first call, right? Well, news and Twitter, I suppose, depending on how you see Twitter these days. Um, but um, but but the benefit there is I distinctly, for instance, remember when NBC became the first broadcast network to outlaw the terms alien and illegal immigrant in favor of undocumented immigrant. And it doesn't matter where you sit on the political spectrum. The, the fact remains that literally a change of a noun, whether it's helpful to that community or in the case of Trump saying China virus Kung flu that actually damns us, nouns and getting those right in the news is really important too. So I think the first challenge is what formats are we going to focus on and how do they actually dovetail and communicate with each other, right? Um, this is why like we're always so grateful to be able to collaborate with so many of the activist groups because I, I don't know the new jargon. I don't know that, you know, multicultural should actually precede the term BIPOC now because it decenters the term for women, right? And so I think that's number one. How are all these going to play together? Uh, the second challenge that we're now facing is, is it Asian American? If it's Asian American, is it inclusive of all Asian Americans? Because that term is not because it omits Pacific Islanders. And then secondly is global globally, to what extent, whether you're a third culture kid or otherwise, are you focusing on the API diaspora or APIs just in this country? And this is very complex because as we're seeing with the Middle East and with China, sometimes all of us, despite maybe growing up here entirely, are are forced to be in the in-between space where we have to answer for our motherland that either A, we've never been to, or B, just aren't experts in. So that sort of globality is is creating an immense amount of confounding factors. The third thing that I would say, though, is there's there's sort of a dual approach uh, that we call carrots and sticks or seeds and weeds to rectifying these sort of pernicious narratives while 
confirming new positive ones. So the weeds or the sticks are those four pernicious narratives or stereotypes that have persisted across media. We're making sure that studios and networks don't perpetuate them. So just to go through quick examples, yellow peril, the fact that COVID-19 is every API's fault, which we know is not the case. Um, the same thing befell the Muslim community after 9-11. It was not the Muslim community's fault, period, right? Um, and, and the way that you address that in media is you stop casting us as villains, right? Second is perpetual foreignerism. The fact that we have been legally excluded as well as interned and to this day are still relegated to best foreign picture category to the point that, you know, even yesterday, the New York Daily News published this cartoon that was incredibly xenophobic that portrayed mayoral candidate Andrew, Andrew Yang as a tourist. Uh, tourism, without question, is a euphemism for a foreigner, right? Uh, and you can we can debate all day long whether Andrew should be mayor, but the fact remains that you have indicated that he, because of, you know, physically because of race and then also his identity is not American enough or New York enough to be mayor of the city. Um, third is meekness. So you already articulated this very astutely earlier, Michelle, but, you know, API men have been grossly emasculated. API women have been grossly fetishized to the point of fatality in the case of Atlanta. Um, and so we need to make sure that we appear not just physically strong, but also emotionally strong and mentally strong, and that we have actual societal agency. Uh, and then the final narrative that we're trying to get rid of is model minority myth, which unfortunately means a lot of things these days, but most notably, um, it, it perpetuates the stereotype that we're all crazy and rich. And, and while a subset may be, the reality is we have the widest income disparity, and it actually over indexes in certain regions and within certain ethnicities. Uh, and as good stewards of not only our, our community, but our, our species, humanity, we have a responsibility to lift everyone up. So what we've done is we, we meet with every major studio and network and educate them on here are the stereotypes that candidly you cannot perpetuate anymore, right? Uh, whether it's Scarlett Johansson playing another Asian or otherwise. Uh, but secondly, in terms of the sticks and affirmation, we don't just want to address the things we hate. We also want to punctuate the things we want and love and to project new and affirming imagery. This is why Benny's work at Next Shark is so important. This is the new face of Asian America, whether he likes it or not, right? Or whether he, he stands as, as the voice or not, right? Um, I mean, one of the best examples of that is like BTS and Blackpink and K-pop. That is a new affirming contextual blend of an identity that we have to be proud of. Um, Parasite as well, you know, is a film, best picture, best director, best writer and screenplay. The reason we were so proud of that is that is not in a category it is a comedy a thriller and it's not in english that is a category unto itself and so this again is not just about dismantling pernicious stereotypes it is affirming a new face and being an agency of our community i'll give you one more that sits more in tech um one of my proudest sort of uh uh, uh I, I guess uh, i guess things that I learned was even though APIs, according to Harvard Business Review, are the least likely demographic to be promoted to management and API women in particular are the lowest, uh, I actually uh, am really proud that over 20% of the companies worth over half a billion dollars founded in the last decade have at least one API founder. Right. Um, these are, of course, Katrina Lake of Stitch Fix, uh, Eric Wren of Zoom, um, the, the three gentlemen of DoorDash. Right. And these are not just industry making companies. These create billions of dollars of market value. You are in your C-suite and you control your board because of that. So we've destroyed the bamboo ceiling there. You employ tens of thousands of people, not just within our community, but all communities, so forth and so on. Right. That is the new face of our community. So once again, like how do we in a dual fashion dismantle the baggage that we've been given, but then secondly, is definitively affirm a new face narrative and a set of agencies. Wow, you made such such amazing points. And I appreciate that you were able to kind of turn that around and talk about, okay, this is what we want to do positively. This is how we can, can be affirming. I'm curious, uh, Jonah, uh, what are your thoughts about the opportunities to um, turn things around, find tangible solutions, especially in, in the entertainment work that you're doing? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I think it comes from within our own community and also allyship um, for people that are not part of the AAPI community. So it's interesting. You brought up the PricewaterhouseCooper accountants, a little joke that happened at the award ceremony. And um it was actually because of that um, really stereotypical uh, depiction that um, there was a Caucasian uh, director named Josh Tate who works a lot with J.J. Abrams. 
he had a script um, called Mercy and he ended up, uh, originally it was meant for two, uh, a couple that was just a Caucasian couple. He didn't really think much of it, but that's the direction he was going in. And after watching um, that, uh, that on TV, the, the PricewaterhouseCooper example, um, he was so enraged <laughs> and upset that he was like, you know what, why can't these two leads be Asian? And so he actually ended up asking around in the industry um, for up and coming Asian actors and end up casting Harry Shum Jr. and myself to play those roles. So I think it's wonderful to uh, to partner with allies who are also helping us and supporting um, our battles and our fights. And I, I think that's one example of something I've gotten to be part of that I'm really, uh, really grateful for. Um, and then also just in terms of the effect that the general public can have on um, what we see in entertainment. Um, One example that I really love is when they were making the movie Hellboy, they had a Caucasian actor, Ed Scrine Screen. I miss, I might be mispronouncing his last name um, who was originally cast to play uh, a role that was supposed to supposed to be for an Asian. Um, And so uh, across social media, there was such a, anger and frustration and an outcry and an outrage about him playing this role that he decided to step down from the role. And then um, the production actually ended up recasting the role and they recast that role as Daniel Day Kim. So, you know, I think it's wonderful that we can use uh, social media to, um, to really uh, be vocal about what we want to be seeing in entertainment and, it's great when it actually does impact the stories that we get to see and who's playing the roles and the stories that we get to um, experience. Excellent. And Harmeet, in um, the newsroom, where are you seeing or what do you see as some of the, the future um, the future ways that, that uh, newsrooms can, can be more affirming of the uh, Asian American community? Yeah. um, So one piece of it, obviously, is just thinking about who is in the newsrooms, uh, making sure that we have key AAPI voices in the newsrooms and, you know, not just one or two, but but a lot. You know, uh, AAPI in itself is such a comprehensive umbrella term that represents so many different identities. And, um, you know, we can't be fully represented just by one or two or three people. And, you know, I want to emphasize that that um, needs to be the case, not just at the reporter editor level, but also um, in terms of the manager and executive level, the people who are in power making those decisions, because, um, you know, it's one thing to have reporters who are seeing these stories and want to do them, but it's another to for them to actually be empowered and um, know that their organization values those stories. Um, And then just in terms of um, editorially speaking, I think um, one thing we need to really do um, as a journalism industry is make sure that we are not presenting AAPI folks as a monolith. Um, I think there is real value to that term, to that umbrella term when we want to talk about broad trends, but um, there's also value in getting just really granular and specific about who it is you're talking about, because if you don't get specific and you don't get into those nuances, like Bing mentioned, you miss critical pieces about um, certain subgroups being more economically disadvantaged um, than others and certain disparities, you miss things like that. And then last thing I'll say is just um, helping to elevate um, API history. I think so much of that um, has just gone underreported and undertaught um, as a society and you know we have been here for hundreds of years um and our presence here is not new um and i think we need to help normalize that and help people understand that you know these stories are just as american as any other person absolutely and Benny, I know we're gonna you're gonna need to leave us a little bit early, but before you take off, can you share with us your thoughts on on this question as well? Just what are the opportunities to be more affirming to the AAPI community? I think I can really speak on you know what what we're trying to do here at Next Shark. I mean, for the last like uh, year, we've a lot of it has been. It's, it's interesting because like when you are kind of immersed in the whole process, and you know we've been covering hate crimes for you know 
over the last year and a half. And at this point, it seems like there's at least like, you know, one major case a day now, which is, you know, super, super concerning. Right. And it's taken a big toll on, you know, our mental health, um, you know, my staff's mental health. I mean, in fact, I mean, I, I've held like, you know, multiple mental health sessions for, you know, my staff members, because if you think about it every day, viewing, viewing very violent footage, having to verify stories, talking to victims. I mean, it does take that, take a toll on your mental health. And I think that, you know, some of the things that I'm looking at is what's next after like, you know, all these things. I mean, like, obviously, you know, I think my reporters have, you know, and at the collective of the, of the entire community, I think that we've done a good job in, you know, getting the mainstream attention. I mean, I, I've definitely seen more and more like, you know, major players outside of the Asian American community, you know, speaking up, uh, whether it's A-list celebrities, whether it's, you know, corporations that are tagging resources and including Next Shark in that process. Um, but I think for us, you know, as Harmeet also mentioned, is that um, it's also to, um, you know, tell more stories um, about Asian America. I mean, some of the things that, you know, we have a young audience um, every time, like we give a piece of history, you know, whether it's, you know, Vincent Chin existed or there was a woman named Yuri Koshiyama that was so pivotal during the civil rights movement. Right. Um, and a, a lot of the times, a lot of these uh, commenters are like, Oh my God, I, I never, I never knew about this. Right. And secondly, some of the things that we're also trying to highlight in the newsroom too, is like, yeah, these, these incidences are happening, but who is helping, who is, you know, doing, doing, you know, the work and, you know, there's amazing people that I'm in awe of, like, you know, this 13 year old, you know, girl that is in San Francisco, you know, she's held, you know, she held a, uh, you know, a, a stop Asian hate rally in San Francisco, you know, two months ago in which hundreds of people attended just this past Saturday, she held a, you know, a black and gold rally to call for, you know, black and, you know, Asian solidarity where she got like, you know, speakers from, you know, so many different arenas, you know, to come speak. You know, and a year prior to that, she hand handmade um, hundreds of you know masks for um, you know frontline workers and everything, right? And aside from that, those are the types of people that we want to highlight. We also want to highlight even the everyday Asians, whether they're frontline workers, whether they're you know C-suite executives or or whatever, because like they make up of, of of you know a part of the fabric of America. An Asian American story is an American story, and that's something that you know I've always that that's the rhetoric that I think I want us to continue. That you know we do make our contribution to this country, just like everybody else. So we belong here, just like everybody else. Absolutely. Well, we are getting um, some really great questions that are coming in for our panelists. And before I go there, I just want to apologize because it's not you, Benny, who's going to need to leave us a little bit early. It's Bing. So my apologies. Um, but uh, real quickly, let's let's uh Go ahead, and I want to remind everyone that if you do want to ask a live question, please raise your hand, and uh, you can certainly do that. But we have a question who's come in from Aishan, and uh, this individual is asking, I really think that comedians that leverage their comedy based on racial stereotypes, especially if they themselves belong to the same community, is really degrading to the image of Asians. How does the panel feel about this and their lives, and how do you deal with those issues every day? Jonah? Early, uh, so, sure. So I think earlier it was mentioned that um, a different comedian actually got some of his um, shows pulled, right, as a result of like perpetuating some harmful stereotypes. So I think what we're going to see more and more is um, the public holding uh, people with platforms and celebrities and comedians to higher standards um, and, and higher responsibility. And so if that's something... Um, I think that's something that we as a public can be vocal about that. We don't want to see just um, stereotypes being used uh, as jokes and for people um, groups of people to be used as the butt of uh, very basic degrading jokes. I'll give another perspective. I completely agree with that um, creativity is very hard, but the reality is if you actually poll college students these days and ask them who their greatest hero is, the answer is not Kanye West or Kim Kardashian rest in peace. Uh, it is actually Elon Musk. And so the reason I mention this is because most of us will not be actors or comedians. Many of us do not want to be actors and comedians. But what that does mean is we need to actually promote other forms of heroes and leaders, including those who are literally inventing industries that will help us inhabit and inhabit other planets once we have absorbed our sort of you know welcome here. Um, these are people who are fundamentally reshaping healthcare. These are people like Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, right? And candidly, as just as Jonah astutely said, if we promote these other people who may not re represent us, right, that is incumbent on those of us with platform power, and that's incumbent on us as consumers to rectify. Um, so I think that's the other side. We really 
need to promote other forms of leaders that you know can be aspirational to these next generation, whether it's APIs or otherwise. So we have a question from um, Dave. He says, hello, panel. I'm Caucasian, born here in the U.S., and my wife is from Asia. My children have been bullied at school on occasion for their Asian characteristics as they predominantly took on their mother's genes. Recently, my son quit eating rice, and I found out that his classmates have been calling him nicknames such as Rice Box Kid, or they would joke that he would go eat, he should go eat his rice. Also, kids often make comments about the shape of his eyes. Both my children seem to be ashamed of their Asian culture, and this truly breaks my heart. Do you have any recommendations on how I could advise my children when they encounter this type of behavior? I am thinking, you know, it, this, is, this question is relevant to me. It's, it's, it's relevant to me in, in many ways. I just became a dad um, a few weeks ago. So my, my, my not, not a few weeks ago, my, my son is about uh, um, a month and a month and two weeks now. So a month and a half old now. And, you know, I, I always think about like those challenges that, you know, he's going to face, you know, I, you know, those, right. Those lunchbox moments. I have those myself. I mean, you know, whenever I brought lunches to school, when I was a kid, kids made fun of me for it. You know, they would, they would point at it and, you know, Oh, is that dog? You know, Oh, Benny's a dog eater, you know, like stuff like that. Or they, you know, when I walk by, they call me Chinatown and everything. And, you know, it was, it, it was definitely like, you know, very hard to deal with it. And I wasn't exactly sure, like, you know, who, you know, how do you prepare for that? Right. And I mean, and I think about it as what would I kind of tell my son? And I think that, you know, how I would look at it is like, you know, there are some people in the world that are that are just ignorant and they prefer to, you know, bring people down. And a lot of those times, like, you know, a lot of those times when people like cause pains to other, it also, you know, not not excusing people's like, you know, actions, but it, you know, it come they, they also come from a position of pain too. And it, if that this is how they cope with it, unfortunately, it's kind of like, you know, they, they don't do it in the right way. And I think that I, I would just go by saying that, you know, I mean, for me personally, because I've experienced it, you know, myself, it's like, I, I can relate to those feelings. Right. And I think that um, the only thing I could probably say is that, um, you know, definitely defend yourself, you know, if, if, if you need to, don't put yourself in, in horrible situations and, and what have you. And it's interesting with this question too, because, you know, I, I do get, uh, we get people as young as middle school, like reading, reading some of our, reading some of our stuff. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, something profound happened to me like a few months ago. And so my, my wife, uh, you know, she had a, she had a coworker that's non-Asian and, uh, she had a, um, she, um, you know, she, she had a daughter that was also in middle school and obviously she was non-Asian and, uh, it was interesting because she had told my wife a story. He's like, Hey, you know, I, have been talking about neck shark ever, you know, to my, to, to my kid. And, you know, she started reading a little bit about neck shark. And I guess there was an incident in school where like during recess time, she had saw, she had seen like a, uh, a kid go up to a fellow Asian American classmate and do like slant, slanty eyes. And she immediately ran over and told that girl off. And this is just a middle school student. And like, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, I, I learned all these things and, you know, I, I was reading up on it and, you know, I just, I just knew that it was wrong. And, you know, and so she, she, you know, she, she went up, you know, told the kid off, called the teacher and everything. And I'm like, man, if there was any, you know, I don't care like where next chart goes as a company, like we can, like, we can like make $0 or we can like fail as a business. Like, you know, it's moments like that that really kind of like keep me going that that make me like excited to, to to wake up in the morning and if I can contribute to changing those you know minds as I as I as I go that'll be amazing and you know Dave I know that that doesn't directly answer your question but I think that you know it, this is a this is an issue that is very very difficult to solve and again it involves you know in terms of how do we consume media and I think it involves you know changing you know the, the things that our kids consume to make them much more culturally aware to make sure that that, you know, they, they can see, you know, very, very diverse faces. Um, and, and I think that education begins with, you know, how things are perceived in the media. And I think that it's going to take some time to get there. I think that we're leading in the right direction, but I think that change takes a lot of time. You know, it doesn't take, it, it doesn't rest on one individual. It takes all of us together to make our own sacrifices. And we might not even make those changes in our generation, you know, but guess what? There's been tons of people, ancestors before us that sacrificed, you know, sometimes their lives in order to have the rights that we have today. And so we should honor that by paving the way ourselves for the future generations ahead. Yeah. Well, and I love that story of um, that middle schooler who was going to be an active bystander and and take action. I'll just remind our uh, Micron team members that on the DEI channel, we do have a link to an article that talks about um, how you can be an active bystander as well, if you want to check that out. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and I just cannot thank these panelists enough for for um 
sharing your perspective, um, providing um, insight into um, into this issue, and also um, really kind of ending on how um, we can have a positive impact and and uh, and what some of the positive changes are out there that we can all keep continuing to work toward. Uh, before we let everybody go, I do want to just. Um, show you, um, make recognition of um, something that Micron was able to announce this last Friday. Um, We did join the Asian American Foundation CS Unite campaign, where the company has pledged $2 million over five years. And as of May 20th, this foundation has raised $1.1 billion and is going to be using these proceeds for combating things like anti-AAPI hate, data and research and education. So, just wanted to take an opportunity to let everyone know about that in case they missed that story. So before we go, um, what we usually like to do is end all of our panels with a Go Micron cheer. So I would like to invite all of our panelists to go ahead and take yourselves off mute. I will count down three, two, one, and then I'll say Go Micron, and I ask you to join in with me in doing that. So three, two, one, go Go Micron. Thank you, everybody.